Today's market call is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity. And FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. Little homage to CME Group. This is, what day is today? Thursday. Thursday. It's typically not a CME day, but Tuesday we're in Miami. South Beach. Yep. So we, you know, we got all discombobulated we this did. week. A little jam. But it's Feb 1. And for you folks playing our home game, the letter for February is F. Yeah, no, yeah. wrong. That's actually wrong. See, I got to start so this again. All, so you're all January. January is F. Yeah. February is G. You know what's funny? You said that for 31 days. F. F. So here we are. February. In February short month. Letter G. You know, let, let, I just want to say G. one thing. Okay. Because we got a lot to do today. Okay. We got just a lot to do. We, we got Carter thing. Braxton Worth. Um, but and where butter. risk meets was there butter. is if there was ever a day in the markets where risk meets opportunity today is the, day. Today is the there's day. a lot of risk there's, there's a lot, lot of opportunity all right so let's can we recap a little bit what we did why we're a little discombobulated um we were yeah, down we had a big at week i connections global alts i think uh some of you guys probably saw us broadcasting down there monday and tuesday we had jim chanos with us on tuesday that was a great great conversation uh jim of chanos and co famed short seller he said something interesting guy he said the cheapest thing you can do and they usually say what it's pay, pay attention. Yeah. But he said it's just buy protection, which I thought which, was Which, and we had a conversation about did, that. Did. And that's been true for a while. But, you know, we got into the weeds as to why people that used to buy options yep. and now stop buying them. Now, so, anyway, let's take a look at today's rundown because yep. we do have a lot. Butters, by the way, if it's Thursday, it's butters. Bitch. Yes, yeah. it is. Regional bank bloodbath. I love that. I hear blood. I think of young blood. That, of course, Rob Lowe, great hockey movie. Chart check on yields. Holy shit. Carter Worth. I would say two weeks ago, yeah, ish, yeah, said yields had probably topped out. I think it was off by maybe forty eight hours in terms of the call, yeah, but it's spot on. Well, he got us to close our bearish position in the TL, which worked out well. Which worked that out started, well. That, which was created, I believe, on December twenty eighth or ninth. Perfect, 9th perfect mirroring of a fundamental view, yep. a catalyst driven view. And then the technicals. People ask us all the time, why do you use technicals? You know what I mean? Now, Carter only uses technicals, and he's going to get to that a little we bit. We should do a show around those three things. That's for another time. Okay. Or maybe we're doing that. Yeah. And, of course, Apple. I don't know who put Meta in there. Apple, Facebook, and Amazon earnings. I refuse to say Meta. Well, it's maybe, like maybe our peeps in the chat. If you recall. With, with, with no, 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 no. It's fine. That. But it's like that scene in Coming to America. Do you remember the scene? Yeah. His mama name him Clay. I'm going to call him Clay. Name is Facebook. I'm going to call him Facebook. Anyway, a lot going on. And let's look at these regional bloodbath because, again, people say it's not a big deal. It's just New York community. I get it. Okay. Yeah. I understand. But, you know, a couple bad loans, they're saying it's isolated to them. Yeah. But one has to ask themselves I mean, is it isolated or are we going to see more of this? That's what they said, by the way, in March of last year. Yep. Around a number around Silicon Valley Bank and then First Republic and so on and so on. We'll see how it happened. But a lot of people were making comments today on the back of this. Yeah, it was interesting that um, you know, again, a couple bad loans. I heard, I saw you guys on Fast Money last CNBC's night. Fast Money. Yeah, you guys had a guest on talking about his um, name was um Bill. What was his name? Hockman. No, the Bill Hockman. Bill Hockman. Works for us. <laughs> I wish I could Billy Martin. Uh, Billy Bill Martin. Martin. Oh, yeah. He was from like Raging Capital. Yeah. Uh, was he Can't one of I your, um, one of your, uh, favorite? I liked, you know Yankee what? Well, managers? he's Billy. Well, Casey's, I love Casey Stengel, but yeah. I got to tell you, I grew up with he was sort like of the late fifties, early Miller 60s. Huggins. Was that, was and, that Casey and then, Stengel, you know, Miller right? Huggins and Joe McCarthy. Yeah. If you remember back I liked in the, the day. Joe Torrey. I like Joe. He was Torrey. one of your people. Well, a lot of value. I don't know what that means. Name. All right. Um, he let's, let's, let's do this because uh, listen, we're going to get serious here. People. I am. We are serious. No, I'm just we're saying, deadly serious. Right, let's bring him in. Carter Braxton worth of worth charting. Carter. Welcome. My man. How are you? All right. Let's get before we get into it. Bit. I mean, you what can't carry the lead. What? Bruised and battered. No, listen, Couldn't last night, it. you know, every once in a while you play a hockey game, you got to stick up for That's somebody. Right. And Carter stuck his nose in there last night. Yes, he did. He got clearly. five fighting like a band. I mean, clearly. No exactly. Anyway, here we go. No worse for work. Thanks for being here at Carter Braxton. Yeah. Like, talk to us a little bit about the psychology, you know, as, you know, market practitioners and pundits, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at events like uh, things like uh, Fed meetings, right? And we know that there's volatility after them. We know that there's volatility before and after earnings events and the like. When you, what, what is like all your work and all the years you've been doing this, how do you put 
a Fed meeting up there as like a tradable event? And how do you think about like the work that you do as far as technical analysis with that? Because, you know, Guy and I were talking before the show, you know, you get those the volatility as the, the press conference is going on, the reaction to different, you know, questions in this now, whatever. And then they're usually a trend into the close. But oftentimes that trend gets reversed the next day. It seems like we're having a little bit of that today, Carter. How does like technical analysis help sure. you? that sort of stuff. Well, I mean, I mean, just to look, I mean, you, you can track every month for, and let's take economists trying to predict payrolls. It's one of the most error prone um, endeavors that exists. Uh, the odds of rate cuts, that one is, they're 70%, all of a sudden it's bound to 20. Um, all of that is still just the human condition. And so the idea is that rather than going with the, the point of technicals, right, rather than going with an expert, should we go with Goldman's opinion or Morgan Stanley's opinion or Alarani? That wasn't he a Fed guy? Uh, or his opinion or um, expert one, expert fifty, or we'd go with crowd, the input of many inputs, and it's was never accepted as a concept, but now it's embraced. We don't pick a restaurant because an expert wrote a review in the local newspaper. We pick it because of a Yelp review or it used to be Zagat's. And it's the same thing with crowdsource, crowdfunding, crowd voting uh, for you know, one of these um, talent shows. We want as many inputs as possible. We don't want to listen to the economists X or Y or Z. Uh, there's much more uh, weight when a great number of participants. Now, the pushback quickly is this. They say, but the participant could be a bunch of idiots. Why would we go with a huge group of people who are voting on something, the marketplace versus the experts at, 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 at firm X, Y, Z? But th that's hubris. The experts are people too greater number of inputs, uh, you get a greater uh, outcome. We're going to put up a quick New York Community Bank chart up just because um, traded already, I want to say today, 80 million shares, typically trades about 10 million. You can do that math. So it's on course to trade, I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 times normal volume. This is after yesterday, by the way, on a big volume day. And again, I think the optimist will say it's a New York Community Bank specific. I'll tell you that today, Carter, that stock's making a 24-year low. However, we're not looking to trade that. The next chart is we want to take a look at, and that, of course, is the KRE. And New York Community Bank is a percentage of that, obviously. A lot of these small and regional banks are. But let's take a look at the chart that we created for the KRE, and you tell us what you're seeing here. You know, I think we're, again, we're approaching that moving average. We had a huge bounce in the KRE going back to, the spring of last year for obvious reasons uh, when it cr cratered, bounced, traded off again, bounced again. I look at this and say, okay, maybe we have found support. I also think that there are probably more shoes to fall fundamentally. Thoughts on the KRE? Sure. Um, to inform the thoughts on the KRE, if we can, let's go to NYCB first and just do a simple uh, two-year chart. And I want to make a point about um, that, which is the the thing that's causing weakness in, in the carry. So if we can, let's go to NYCB. Now, here's what I would point out. And there, this is, this is fascinating or interesting or just important. The low of March 13th, right there, of course. Now, why is the stock on today's news stopping right at that low? Mm -hmm. Is that a price to book, price to tangible book, price to cash flow, price to sales? Is that enterprise ID beta? No, 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 and no. The answer is that levels matter on charts, and we can get into the details of that, but it's stopping exactly at a prior low for a reason. It's because that's where a lot of capital was committed before. Um, and so taking this, which is the event that's causing the KRE, uh, and it's all about technicals, let's go to the KRE chart that you had up there, and uh, the dip, uh, is likely to carry, by my work, to uh, the moving average. So if one is looking to commit capital on the long side, I would hold off, and I think you can do it probably at 44 plus or minus. Yeah, so this is one Guy was talking about yesterday, and we were saying, like, well, you know, why were yield, uh, yields weak, you know, the way they were? And, you know, I guess, you know, it made sense on a day where you're seeing some stress in the banking system, and it brings us back to your point about that March-April period um, of last year. And it was a period when, you know, the Fed was fully engaged in a rate-hiking cycle, but they did add a lot of liquidity, right, to kind of stave off any sort of contagion. Um, and there was a little mini contagion. So here we are now, the Fed is clearly paused the rate hikes and they've told us 
that, right? But the, the thing that happened in the last 24 hours, and it's been happening quietly under the surface for the last few weeks or so, is the probability of the March rate cut has been dropping, right? So if we look at the CME Fed fun tracker here it's down to about 40 percent for march and you know about a month ago it was like 75 almost 80 percent and you know it's shocking to me on a day you know after we saw the volatility in the stock market after the fed basically said that there's not a strong likelihood they don't have a strong impetus for cutting at the March meeting that we're still at 40%. So I just want to bring you guys really quickly, and I'd love to get your take, Guy, on this. Um, this was out of Axios today. And, you know, I'm just going to read the quote, and they're going to put it up right here. So the big picture, America appears to be in the midst of a productivity boom, the likes of which we haven't seen in years. Technology. Well, it, well, I mean, listen, we, and we've seen this in different pages, but I, I thought it's this combination, Guy, right. that's really important. It's allowed inflation to keep coming down, and other times we've seen inflation low, and they wanted it up, okay, with the productivity gains we've seen. Um, along. Side rapid growth, solid wage gains, which we had not seen in those prior periods, right? Because the productivity that we're seeing through technology was actually suppressing wages, if mm -hmm. you will, right? Um, and a thriving labor market. But Powell appears, and you got a question, skeptical that those productivity gains will be sustained, a bis big risk to what has been so far an economic success story. So that I think that's a really interesting thing to kind of debate. And it actually is going to be at the core of whether the Fed does start to kind of uh, you know get a bit more dovish. It's interesting that he has skepticism around things that are working in yeah. on his behalf. I mean, everything is lining. Like you read all those things, yeah. you're like, my God, this couldn't have worked out any better. Obviously, he is concerned that those productivity gains are not going to last to the extent that they have now. I, you know, I can't speak to that. I mean, if he's concerned, I guess I should be concerned as well. But this is this is the perfect puzzle for what they've yeah. been trying to do. Now, all granted, it's happened over a lot longer period of time than I think they probably thought. But here we are today. On the other side of the equation, though, we're seeing things that should be concerning to him, I would imagine, coming in the form of a resurgence in some of these inputs yep. that inflation is based on. So there's a lot uh, you've here been for sure. You've been saying that and it has been turning up yeah. since the summer and the fact that yesterday that appeared to be an acknowledgement about it. And Carter, you know, I know that you've watched the markets, listen to the markets or pined on the markets. And, and again, you know, we talk about fundamentals, but you also, I know you pay attention to what sentiment is around the macro. Right. And one of the things that seems very clear and folks who've been around for a while and folks who know fed chair Powell, he does not want to be remembered mm -hmm. as the guy who, thought things were transient in 2021, was late to act, right? And then took his foot off the pedal just to have inflation become entrenched. Thoughts on that? Because I think this is, it's it's going to present lots of opportunities to trade. We're going to talk about yields in a second. And you have traded them well in this environment, but thoughts on just kind of the, the, the commentary that we've heard over the last couple months. Yeah, I mean... It, look again. There's so it's such a it's such a powerful role, right? To be able to control the money. It, it, imagine any poker table you go to, or you control the table. You can always get your way. And yet at the same time, there is that also. And we have the idiom, the great idiom: "Don't fight the Fed." And yet yeah. at the same time, no one is bigger than the market. And bond vigilantes in the '80s have proved that. Um, what we know is this is still a human being who gets up in the bed, pulls his pants on, like the rest of us. And he doesn't really have any more insight than. Uh, the marketplace, and he has the money that he can influence to some extent the outcome. But what I, what I, I think it's important to say this. I mean, think about Hank Paulson in 08. This is a Goldman Sachs partner. You can't be any more uh, a wealthy man of four or five hundred million himself, and uh, the rating agencies, Moody's, and, uh, and and so forth. And they're saying all of them in 08 in June, July, and August, nothing's wrong. Economy sound. We are literally going to the teeth of the financial crisis, and you're talking about experts who can't find their glasses, not even downgrading any bonds. The, a former Goldman Sachs partner, uh, Treasury Secretary, uh, I don't see anything wrong. This is just another guy, like all of us, who is in the dark, okay? And we try to take the tools, the small lights that we can shine where we can and try to make our judgments. But he has no more insight than the great legions of uh, PhDs and neuroscience and valedictorians and Rhodes Scholars working throughout the street. Period. I think I saw Billy Squire warm up for Queen Lonely in 1980. 
in the dark lonely is the night lonely is the night but in the dark is another song Great by the album. way you were talking about arthur burns wasn't the album in the dark i believe so i'd have to go look maybe amanda or somebody can get my ear maybe i know hawkman lonely knows. is the night exactly i was billy squire was big for about a three year period anyhow yeah arthur burns to your point about fed chair pal he does not want to be remembered as the arthur yeah. burns 50 years later Let's go to treasuries. And I said this earlier in the show. I know you heard it pull up your chart in terms of 10-year yields. You said that you thought yields were headed back lower. Now, I'll tell you, I think there was a 48-hour period or so where yields continue to go higher. And this is not casting aspersions in any way. But effectively, you, to the, almost to the day, you nailed that one, Carter. And here we are. Last I looked, I think, what, it would be a 385 or so, maybe lower than that at this point. I think, as Dan mentioned earlier, it's on a couple different things. I think this New York community bank thing is adding some fuel to the fire in terms of lower yields. But let's take a look at your chart. The arrow's pointing down. I know what you think. You think yields continue to go down. Yesterday, that wasn't good for the market. Today, a little bit different, but sort of walk us through this one. Yeah, you have a trend, circumstance one. You have a break in trend, circumstance two. You have a counter trend rally back to very close to uh, the underside of the trend line as annotated by the right hand shoulder of that formation. And then you have resumption of weakness or lower yields. And so anybody's guess. But uh, look, the, the premise, at least from this seat, remains is the long term premise, right, is lower yields, lower dollar, lower crude oil and lower general levels in the stock market i.e take profits yeah it's interesting like i love this chart because like your little hats that you put on there that's clearly uh, that head, they are? well a little head and shoulders little thing there and i love it that you changed your view we had that break of that uptrend that had been in place for two plus years right carter and then um that was kind of the confirmation of your bearish view on yields but then you turn it around because you like the idea of playing for a check back that'll confirm your view and then you turn it around again and now you think that you could have drawn a little neckline right down there um over the last yeah. few months or so um where would you expect this yield to get some support if it were to continue take out the low from a month go or so and uh where, where where does it find the next level of support i think it, i see it down there very near that that it kind of sort like of 340 yeah down in there yeah yeah okay yeah. um all right we appreciate that all right so here's the other one we had the fed mm -hmm. we had a couple big tech earnings earlier in the week uh interestingly enough carter tuesday afternoon i'm curious uh and i'm sure you were like sitting on the edge of your seat watching guy and me on the fast money um you know we had amd down about six and a half percent as their call was going on we had google alphabet down six or so percent as their call was going on we had microsoft that was kind of banging around but it was down it was down like one to two percent or so um all of them after the you know yesterday's after the opening they call all caught a little bit of a bid okay giving back you know getting back a bunch of those lines. what was your take on what you saw out of those stocks what did they show you and then obviously tonight's the big one that we're going to focus on apple and meta uh guys facebook oh, uh, and yeah, of course yeah, amazon no, no, no. right so the initial reaction obviously was poor and uh despite this uh sort of strength today still in general they're down uh post earnings now tonight in many ways is important because it's more cap the three that are reporting but also apple because it's the it is by and by far and away the most widely owned um and it's the one that's had the most trouble uh, it's been struggling for almost a year and a half and uh, we have some charts that'll look at that but apple is uh, at risk i think of yet further slippage it yeah. hasn't that, um, that's that's our chart right there really quickly. Mm -hmm. We put that on the Insta. Guys, you got to follow guy.adami on the Instagram. By the way, risk reversal yeah, media. just a quick interruption. Yeah, yeah. Bill, Bill Hawkinson, I mean, he's unbelievable. Why? Because he texted me during the show. He's like, the name of that album was Don't Say No by Billy Squire. Yeah. 1981, I was off by a year. Okay. I, mean, well, I, I thought it was about 81 because at that point, oh, yeah, I was yeah. probably you know, 10, 11 years old. That was when I was really getting I into rock and roll. I was yeah, you were much older. Much older. Um, sorry about that. But, but here, Carter, um, 
you had this note on worth charting and, and I love it. Like, like, you know, listen, we got lots and lots of stuff from the cheap sheets, uh, cheap seats, right? Whether it's on the Twitter, it's on the email, it's mm -hmm. on whatever people, people generally don't come up to your face and tell you, you suck. They like to do that, people from, do their, that to me. from their anonymous Mostly um, at home. Twitter accounts, but you do this amazing thing. You have this service. People can subscribe to it. It can go into your email box and you are very transparent. It's all there. Every chart you ever publish, right? Every call you ever make. And, and I love this note and seeing it in my inbox yesterday, um, I thought it was really helpful. Walk us through your take on Apple. And I'm just going to say one last thing before you go is that in almost every appearance that you have been on CNBC's Fast Money over the last six months or so, and we've been talking about the Mag7, we've been talking all this stuff around generative AI, you have pointed out routinely, yes, this is the largest largest market cap company in the world. And it still gets a lot of attention, but it acts very poor on a relative basis to the S&P 500. Yeah, I mean, and, and so a lot of people say relative is the only thing that matters. A lot of people say, I don't care about relative. I don't make relative money. I need to make money. And one could say, you know, Apple is still up, but it's really, it is about relative performance. And so Apple has just not performed in line with its peers. Uh, and uh, its peers being the technology sector or the market. And so um, this follow-on report from this week for, for clients and uh, worth charting subscribers was simply starting with the, we, uh, you get pushback in certain endeavors, but one of the most aggressive uh, was we would, would sell it all. There was a report on August 17th of 2022, sell it all, Apple, that's it. And while you can do tactical trades, we try to do that for instance in treasuries, flip it around, get short, get long, or gold. The Apple call, we stuck with this. This is just something we don't want to be involved in. And so the point was to articulate each and every report that was published since saying sell, sell, sell. And what's happened, Apple's up. It's up 6% 6 since uh, that time. But it's the tech sector is up 35. The market's up you know, 14, 15. The point is that we're looking for alpha and alpha is relative performance. And so there's something wrong with this stock. And I don't know what it is. You guys probably have great insights into that. They don't make their watches well, or maybe people don't replace their phones or God knows what it is. But there is the chart. It's a ratio chart depicting Apple divided by the tech sector, which gives you a relative strength line. And so, um, with a little dumb luck and a little bit of uh, good work, uh, the report of August, then one month later in September of 2022, Apple did peak and it's been in free fall since. Now at some point it's gonna be right to flip this around. Apple will get cheap, right? Uh, but I don't think so yet. It's interesting, you know, I'm going back and looking. When you put that out, I think Apple in August of 22 was $172 stock and, you know, it traded down to, it basically at the end of the year as $125, $128 stock. So that was the right call. And if Apple were the only stock listed, you'd be like, my God, this has been so great. But to your point, there are obviously other things that have been better. And I think to a large extent, you know, this rebirth of the, you know, large cap, high growth technology names in the semis have probably created this situation for Apple. But I'll say this as well. When Apple, and this is, I've said this, but it's worth repeating. There was a time when Apple was a growth company, an ex a great growth company, and it traded about 11 and a half times forward earnings. So when Apple was a growth company, it traded like a deep value stock valuation. Now that it is effectively, a, you can say it's a value stock-ish, maybe, it's trading with growth multiple. And that's not hyper hyperbole. I mean, it's probably trading at these levels close to 30 times next year's numbers. And obviously, we'll know a lot more tonight. Also, as Dan has pointed out, Margins have been basically flatlining for a while. Single, mid single digits EPS and earnings growth. I mean, if this was called anything but Apple, you'd be like, why is this stock here? Now, we've also mentioned, Dan, that this is the beneficiary of being in over 300 ETFs, of which it's one of the top 15 holdings. So money flows works in on Apple's behalf. But yeah. you got to know what you're buying right here because I'm not saying their best days are over. I'm saying their best growth days might be. Over. So, so here's the thing. I'm actually going to push back uh, a little bit on this <laughs> one. And, and I'll tell you why. I actually think that the relative underperformance has to do. And I think it's very clear when you see Microsoft has overtaken it. Right. Market That's cap another terms, name. 
it's there's no gen gen generative ai play in the name right now right and so if the story that's caused the relative weakness over the last few weeks is that iphone shipments are going to be down 10 to 15 percent this year okay something fundamental we don't know whether that's the truth or not um we'll see in, in the implied guidance and, and then that they give um okay so right now that relative underperformance suggests that people are bearish that mm -hmm. they're that the sentiment is poor there's not a lot wrapped up into the things that have driven nvidia up a trillion dollars in market cap over the last year a trillion dollars higher in microsoft over the last four, four months so when you talk about margins in apple and you talk about that expected eps growth well for this year it's expected to actually be mid you know maybe seven eight percent on sales growth of maybe you know four to five percent or something like that if there's ever a gen ai product if there's ever a reason right for people to start using more services this is almost like that kind of uh razor and um yeah. you know like the shaver sort of, sort of thing <laughs> give and, away the razor and, uh, and, and, bend yeah. people over for the blades yeah and i'll make this other point okay expected margins gross margins this year 45 percent. last year they were about 44 percent. the year before that they're about 43 the year before that they're about 42 so they actually have been inching up so there is the potential for an inflection in this story if they actually smartphone units are not as bad as expected and when we get to june and they have their developers form it's going to be all ai they haven't said a single word about okay it. if so, there's something real that's all i'm no, saying i'm fine. trying to take the other side of it so to me look how crappy that stock tax pull up a two-year chart you know you're talking about when carter was last talking about it two years ago at 172. Mm -hmm. Think about it. This stock is not far away from there. And think about how much higher the s p and the nasdaq are. well to, to his point is that now yeah. to your point about margins have been incrementally improving yeah. agreed they've been incrementally improving because services revenue has gone from about 16 and a half percent close to 25 percent. so that's where their margins are so if you have that kind of growth in services yep. if i told you that and said where are margins you would have said margins got to be closer to 60 percent. what it means is yes they're making up on the services side but they're losing it somewhere else so for them only to be yeah. incrementally higher on the margin side, given the services growth, yeah. there's obviously something wrong somewhere else. Anyway. The, yeah, but, but the best part about the story right now, and I don't mean to sound overly bullish about it. And, and again, I, I listen, listen, I think the stock is probably going down if they do highlight the fact that, that you know, like hardware sales are going lower. They have a 2 billion installed base. Yeah. Okay. So at some point it can't get much higher. Right. And so if they're able just to kind of maintain the margins on the hardware and then grow, you know, incrementally their service usage and everything like that. And that will happen through better services. Like they could be AR, VR, AI enabled this, and that, or whatever. So who knows? Again, uh, listen, I think it's a healthy debate. No, it's a lot this to is talk what's listen, playing out in the stock. hundred percent. I mean, it's a, it's a great, that's the conversation around yeah. the stock. Well, listen, I'll just say this guy, when the stock was trading, you know, at its highs, just, you know, four or five months ago, before it just went and made a new high last month, um, you know, your call was for 160 or something. It didn't get too far away from Got that. Got down right and, to the moving and, average. And you weren't pressing it there. Carter, you weren't pressing it. We saw by that note. And so it is a tradable stock. So I'll just leave it um, at that. We probably went a little bit of overkill. Carter, walk us through... Um, you know, Amazon, this is one that you've highlighted um, that you are generally optimistic on. It, it's well below its all-time highs, which is, you know, in the MAG-7. That's not something that we've seen a lot well below those highs. Talk about a little bit what you're seeing here. Right. So that's the the opportunity or the problem. But, I mean, whereas so many things have returned to and many have exceeded their former all-time highs, uh, Amazon has headroom room to run. And my hunch is to play this one on the long side. I agree with that, by the way. We've seen this before where, you know, Apple reports, excuse me, Amazon reports, mm -hmm. they decide they want to sort of tweak margins to the upside. Everybody focus, laser focus on operating margins coming better than expected. And this thing is off to the races. You get an AWS kick and this stock can be trading back to sit where that horizontal line is. So, I, you know, and given the technicals, I'd line up with Carter on this. But with that said, I am not here to tell you that is some tell on the economy mm -hmm. or, you know, the broader market. I think it's very Amazon specific. Yeah. And, and again, you know, when this stock has actually had seen some gaps post earnings to the upside over the last year or change, it has to do with their retail business. And we've talked about the, some of the parts of this company where, you know, there's been times where literally the retail business has been left for dead. It's been literally priced at zero and it's all been about AWS. So this story, AWS, okay, 
which has gone from growth of like 30, 40% down to low teens or something. That's been one of the reasons why it's been held back as Google, as Microsoft have taken share. And then when you think about Google and Microsoft, maybe better positioned with generative AI, those are the reasons that lots of companies will go to a public cloud service to access those you know, services that are being offered there. So Amazon, you know, has to play a little catch up in Gen AI so that more people are going to be attracted to AWS, which is that higher margin sort of business. But, you know, don't underestimate the importance of retail and their ability mm -hmm. to get margin there to guys point on the operating um, margin front there. So that one's interesting to me. I, this is like kind of the way you talk about charts to me. I talk about the fundamentals here. I just say pair of twos to me. Like I almost kind of want to wait and hear what they're going to signal about the consumer, about enterprise demand, about where they are with Gen AI and just kind of play it out from there or play it after the fact, if that makes sure. sense. Sure. I mean, you know, and that's the beauty of this uh this endeavor, you don't have to trade anything, right? Um, one doesn't, and a lot of the all-time greats never are highly exposed going into an earnings announcement. They Last overall. one is Facebook. Let's throw your chart up, Carter. Um, your horizontal arrow suggests you're not expecting much here. I don't know. Quite frankly, I don't know what to expect. I mean, we had all those gaps. As this thing was cascading lower, created a bunch of gaps. All those gaps have subsequently been filled to the upside. To, to my eye, there are probably some remaining gaps now on the downside. I'm not suggesting we fill them anytime soon, but the stock has had a heroic run. Valuation is still reasonable. It's been the year of, uh, what do they call it? The year of efficiencies. So here we are, CBW. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a juxtaposition with Amazon, whereas Amazon has not made it back to the high, and that either is the problem or the opportunity. This has. And so my thinking is that it will back and fill and then it's not a great uh, long or, frankly, a short going into. Uh, valuation, I mean, always a hard thing, of course. I don't, you mentioned maybe being reasonable. Google's perhaps the cheapest of all. And look at it. It's that's right. Whack. So valuation is never a good timing tool. It's just a, a data point that long term is very important for trading, has no bearing at all. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. When I think about um, this move, I, you know, and I've highlighted this again and again, you know, since November of 21, when we saw Meta, Net, Netflix, NVIDIA, and Tesla, okay? Those stocks all lost three quarters of their value over the next year or so from an all-time high, okay? So here we are, and you look at this, and like things couldn't have gone better for Meta, even a large part of this run where there was like, you know, headwinds to digital ad spending and the like here. They stopped spending, or at least the narrative was on the metaverse, but what have they jacked up spending on? Okay, on AI, mm -hmm. and that's also the AI stuff. Is a, so to me, I'd actually much rather be short this thing than long it right here. And I, and again, short is something that most viewers of this program or in the markets don't participate in that activity. But I'd be looking at puts or put spreads or something like that on a near term basis. I think this probably checks back to that level in which it broke out from you know a month ago. I just think a lot of these stocks are just way ahead of their skis. And going back to what we started this whole conversation with. If we were to go into some period like last March, April, with you know the signature and the Silicon mm -hmm. Valley and so whatever, these stocks think about the sentiment related to them now versus uh, you know ten months ago. It's lights out. All right. Last thing before we get out of here, we've been talking a lot about the QQQ, um, Carter. You have a chart, but guy, really quickly. You know, on Friday's Fast Money, I highlighted the fact I was almost jumping out of my seat. I was like, if you wanted to look at all these earnings that we had in the NASDAQ 100, we had this Fed meeting, which I made the point where expectations were really low, mm -hmm. which to me gives you the opportunity of a surprise as it relates to volatility. And we did get one. The QQQ looked like a great, great short. It was implying basically, you know, a 2% move um, in either direction um, over the course of the week or so. Actually, a one percent move, excuse me. Okay, the uh, you were you know, right, yeah, and it, you were, and you were. It was cheap enough where yeah. it allowed you to put yeah. it on. So you we played it with at, at the money um, uh, QQQ puts. We talked about it on Monday's market call. All right, talk to us on what you're seeing, and guy, you can close us out on this thing. Uh, let's see. Do we do we have any charts? Yeah, yeah let's go quickly here. This is a very short term chart where we do or we don't break trend. The red arrow is a judgment, of course. That's mine. Uh, many people will put a green arrow saying we're going to bounce. Apple's going to be great. Meta two off to the rest. Anyway, if we take this and look at it long term, that's the same chart. Now let's annotate it with the highs from before. Let's toggle those two. 
one, two, one, two, and let's put them together, final chart. So the question is, this check back that's now underway, uh, does it continue? We'll see. If it continues, it will represent a break in the trend that's in effect, the intermediate trend since the October low. And then two, if and as it does continue lower, does it find support, um, generally speaking, at the highs of almost two plus years ago? I don't think we'll get away with as benign a sell-off as that. My hunches will sink into support. All right, listen, I think you know where I stand on this. It's interesting today. Maybe it has something to do with the first. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not in that world specifically in terms of money flows and stuff. But, you know, Microsoft right back to 404. Google can't get out of its own way today. But AMD is back on its horse. NVIDIA is within, I think, $6 of its all-time high. Yeah. So you have a lot of these stocks performing today in the wake of, again, I didn't think the AMD, let me put it this way. I thought the AMD guidance was really actually problematic mm -hmm. given what they should be seeing. And, and on top of that, given the fact that the stock nearly doubled since last quarter. Yeah. And so again, so just to kind of highlight a little bit when we were talking on Monday, the 424 weekly put that expires tomorrow after the close, you know, that would cost about four and a quarter or something like that. So that was about 1%. Yesterday, we talked about it right before the Fed meeting. I want to roll those kind of down and out a little bit. I'm looking at February 16th expiration. So that's two Fridays from tomorrow. Okay. The 421 put. The QQQ is basically trading at 421 right now. It would cost you five and a half dollars. Just do the math. I mm -hmm. mean, like, like that's less than one and a half percent to have that exposure, and that would break even down five and a half dollars from 421. You can do that math. I think it's what four uh 415 and a half or something like that. So to me, that's how I'm playing the QQQ. That's how I'm playing all these individual names. I think that we have a collective sell-off in all of them because I don't think any one of these ones tonight is gonna blow the doors up. Apple would have to have an epic beat and raise to get the NASDAQ going much higher. I don't think Meta. And Amazon, no matter what they guide to, has the ability to kind of take the whole NASDAQ um, by fire. Yeah, and I know you know. I mean, there could be an offset thing here yes. where a couple go down, a couple, whatever. But yeah. we'll see. I mean, I, I am I got the popcorn out. We yeah, have a do. front row seat on Fast Money tonight. So tune in. Five o'clock well, Eastern. You? Don't people do that? I think they do. Carter Worth does. Carter Worth comes on the show every once in a while. Everyone, they're all the time. You're I the man, it. Carter. Listen, you know, I want to just kind of quote my main man, uh, Bruce. I mean, you were bruised and battered, but you know, you know, you showed up here, brother. Your guys are still working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're good. Good. Thank right. you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Bud. We, we appreciate you. Love Thanks. Carter. Practice He's work. the man. He's the man. Playing so, hurt. So why, we call saying, that? why wouldn't people show up at five o'clock tonight? No, they show up. Did we, we surround the trade on Tuesday? We had AMD, we had we Microsoft, did. and we had Google. Well, I thought we did a nice bang, job. Bang, bang, we, bang. we surrounded the trades yeah. in, a, in a pithy type of way. You know how to spell it. You made you brought up a really good point before we get out of here. It's I like, thought, you know, we, we, you we, know, it's if you put a million monkeys in front of yeah, a they're gonna have a few good points. keyboard. Yeah. 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 So that's like me. Yeah. If you talk long enough, you're gonna actually have a good point. It's you know well, along okay. the way. Well, we got one really important thing to do, and we butters. Know, yeah, we do. We'll that. say it. But before we, get, thing before I was we gonna... do the butters thing, where oh, we yeah, clip. Say, it's it's not it's not margarine. It's butters, bitch. Yeah, he's the man. People love when he, I do you know, that. He, no, no, you know what? Actually, I don't care if they do it. I like doing no, it anyway. The what the, what, what you point? The really good point you make is that like again, we throw these slides up, we show the implied moves, we show how much market cap is reporting, and this and that, and rarely do they all go in the same direction. But that's why I think the point of saying, okay, well, if Amazon were to gap up five or six dollars because something specific to their business, they got AWS growth reaccelerated or this, and that, that's not going to rip the Nasdaq. You know what I mean? But Apple, if Apple were to indicate a broader slowdown on handsets and, and, you know, then that could take the, you know what i mean the market lower it's just broader like, it's you know, good because you heard taiwan semi yeah. two weeks ago yeah. there i mean big that's why we all put that. all this stuff in a big cauldron it's like a big mosaic guy then you stir it up all it's right. like a shakespeare thing all right bubble bubble toil and trouble remember that whole thing that's shakespeare all yeah right. Okay, let's do this Butters. thing. Go ahead. Okay. You got to do this right because we'd like to clip this thing. Yeah, it goes out on the interweb. Go ahead, please. The social web. All right, it's Thursday on Market Call, and you know what we do here. We preview John Butters. He's the senior earnings insight analyst over there at Fact Set. You can have that report in your inbox on Friday mornings, but we get a preview of it, guy. We're special. We are special. I think the folks over there at Fact Set. They like us and Butters likes us. So you know where to get it, insight.factset.com slash 
subscribe. But let's talk about what we think the big takeaways that we see of his report tomorrow, especially as we're going into probably the most important day of this earnings period, Guy. Here it is. After dropping to an earnings decline of 1.8% on January 19th, the S&P 500 is now reporting a slight earnings growth of 0.1%. For Q4, more companies have beaten EPS estimates 77% and by a wider margin up 6.8% after January 19th compared to before January 19th. Mm -hmm. So what do you take away from that? We talk about this a lot, that sometimes some of these early companies, and we know what they are, it used to be your Alcoa, but it's the it's mm -hmm. the banks, okay? Mm -hmm. And then Netflix, okay? Those all reported before January 19th. Now we're getting into some of the biggest contributors to S&P 500 earnings. I think we're answering our question with that because the work that we highlighted last week from Butters, how important these massive multi or mega cap tech um, stocks, how much growth are expected and how relative they are to the rest well, of the S&P 500. It's so interesting. To look, it's, look, it's fascinating to see if you look, earnings growth rate over this period of time has been upper left, lower right. Yep. The last one notwithstanding. Uh, along that same timeline, the S&P 500 has been lower left, upper right. So it flies in the face of earnings growth. Yep. So what are we talking about all the time? The market's been moving higher on multiple expansion. I mean, we can walk, but that's effectively what's happening here. Now, people will take some solace, I guess, in the fact that you're starting to see an uptick on these earnings growth rates. But how excited should we be, to your point? Yeah. And as you've mentioned, you know, we still have some behemoths coming up. So we'll see. But this is a fascinating chart just to overlay that. And we'll do that, I'm sure, to a certain point to overlay that with what's been going on in the broader market. And it speaks to the exuberance, despite the fact that we've been seeing a decline in earnings. Growth. Right. And I'm going to do something just going to get you all just kind of worked up here a little I bit. Like the stuff. stock market is a discounting. What? Oh, my uh, God. I just did it. It's a, a discounting. discounting no, I understand. Okay. So, but, you so, know, it's something. <laughs> yes, it is. Absolutely. But my point is. And it discounts all the bad news all the time. Think, think about think about this guy. So in late. 2022, okay, when the S&P and the NASDAQ were at their lows, right, we basically were discounting the earnings recession that happened in 2023. And once that was built into valuations and expectations and sentiment, the stock market started to rally, right? And, 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 you know, the earnings were coming down, right? So we had the earnings recession. And so we never actually had the economic recession. So here we are now and we're starting to see, and maybe that uptick, this goes back to what John told us last week, that the top six companies were expected in Q4 to have basically 55% year over year growth. And maybe that has a lot to do with Gen AI and the stuff. So, all right. So that's just putting a little bow on that. And that's how we think about that. This other slide, I think, is kind of interesting, Guy. The increase has been widespread as 10 of 11 sectors have seen an improvement in earnings growth since January 19. Mm -hmm. Industrials, energy, technology sectors have seen the largest increases in earnings growth since January 19. Okay. Get technology, yep. energy, okay, but industrials. Now, that we've seen now that sort of makes sense if you look at the gdp print right yep. you think about the economy and those things so there's been a turn in the industrial sector which makes sense but you know you can you can probably back out to a certain extent and industrials and energy and this whole thing basically lies on the shoulders of the technology mm -hmm. sector as john, you know as john has pointed out so there's a lot to look at here i mean when you see the widespread growth that speaks to the broadening out of the market and stuff but as we have mentioned earlier, over the last couple of weeks, we're right back to where we were in terms of the big seven to 10 stocks driving the bus. Yeah. And, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about interest rates and their impact on discount rates and valuations and this and that, or whatever. And again, I've just heard this again and again, guy, that, you know, big cap tech was the beneficiary when yields were low. They were the beneficiary when yields were going mm -hmm. higher. They were a flight to safety. So when you have that sort of situation where, Big cap tech can't lose no matter what rates do. Uh, are your antennas getting up here a little bit, guy? Uh, you know, again, as I, as I said the other day, I woke up in such a good mood. Yeah, I'm still did. actually still in a good mood. Some really love nice Wednesdays. Tea. Wednesdays are a great day. Hump day. You get over to the next. You yeah. know, tomorrow's today's Thursday. Yeah, it is Thursday. You know what I'm bummed out about though? There's been no hockey now for a while. Yeah, but maybe that's a good. Well, thing. you know why? We got the we got the yeah we do, the, and the, the Rangers on a bit of. As you, you know, you've mentioned this, we got to get out of here. Amanda's like, please yes, stop. Yeah. We we have to get out of here. By the way, that was uh, the John Butters work. 
and we great. can put that slide up again as yeah. I'm sort so of. So you guys, like, like, literally, go there, subscribe, get it to your inbox. We're always going to preview it on Thursdays, and we also get the benefit of John Butters popping on the show every once in a while. We're going to be with them at the Fact Set Focus 2024 event. That's going to be in Miami. That's 29th, last... 30th of April, in May, May 1st. Yeah, we're going to be down April, there. April, May. So I think it, go look at our socials um, on our, you know, it's going to be everywhere we have our socials. Um, they're running a promo for that event. And we're going to be down there. We're so going to be February, doing the I believe February 13th, you still have the early bird rate. Yeah. So there's really no reason. Get all up come. in there, as they say. Excuse me? That's what they say. I, I've never said that in my life. All right. But what I was going to say is. Yeah. Igor Shosturkin was probably the best goalie in hockey two yep. years ago. Und it's hard to dispute that. I mean, you talk about it all the time. He is one of the goalies in the All-Star game this year. He might be one of the five worst goaltenders statistically in the league this year. Mm -hmm. If I were him, which I'm not, I would make the announcement, you know what, my right play does not, it does not, it should not, pre it should not put me into this position I'm stepping down to give somebody that's had a better season a chance. Whoa. And during this period of time, I'm going to work on my game. Ranger fans like myself would embrace that. So I know Igor is a big fan. You know, I'm, I'm not getting on you. I think you know you've sucked this year as well. You know, you got to get the Ducks Just really order. quickly before we leave that. Are you looking so, at something? So you have a Rangers at 30 and 16 atop the Metro yeah, Division Yeah, they played here. well. So Listen. They've, if you had told me at the break they'd be 30 16 and 3 or something, yeah, 30 16 and 3. Pretty good, right? And that's, you know, that's Bruins probably the seventh uh, best Atlantic record. At 31 no, it's probably the sixth or seventh Beck record in the NHL. Mm -hmm. I would have been like, wow, I'll sign up for that. Mm -hmm. But if you had told me where they would be in the first two months of the year and then said, I'd be like, oh man, something must have happened. Mm -hmm. So it's all how you get there, mm -hmm. right? It's all how you get there. It's sort of like the market. How do you get there? But do you generally? Man is not in my year. But you yet, generally, but it's coming. We have the All Star Weekend. Okay, yeah. so the extended period. Um, how do you expect these Rangers? Do, do the teams recalibrate a little bit? Well, they... th there's you know Vancouver just made a big trade. Yeah. They just bolstered. A lot's going on yeah. in the National Hockey League. So a lot of teams are now understanding what they need. The Rangers have to make a move probably before the deadline. I think you'll see that. Apparently, Capo Caco mm -hmm. is on the block. He was the second pick in the NHL draft. I think. Four years ago, maybe five or no. He has not played up to that label, to that draft status. So I think he's being shopped, and they got to get grittier. And I wouldn't be surprised, Dan, Nathan, I know you probably believe this as well. Mm -hmm. They might move a defenseman like Keandre Miller, who I love, mm -hmm. but might be better someplace else because they have a couple guys in the form of Zach Jones that can step in and play. Nobody cares about this shit. I just got a, I just got a text from Amanda in our group chat. It said B U H space B Y E. What does that mean? Bye bye. Oh. I want to thank John Butters. That's just Butters for most of you people. I want to thank the great Carter Braxton Worth, CME Group, FactSet. Check out that FactSet conference at the end of April. We will be there. It's worth going. We're working on some pretty kick ass speakers, so keep that in mind. Yep. Again, thanks to iConnections for an amazing couple of days down there in Miami Beach. We won't be back tomorrow unless some crazy shit happens, but we'll be back on Monday. See you later. See you later. Everyone.